John Beckman, Professor John Beckman, Dr. John Beckman. The adorable, deplorable. Coming to you live from Southern Command with half my brain tied behind my back. Good morning. Latest this week in high fashion, Sydney Sweeney wearing this dress. Should we provide a critique of this dress? I like this. I don't know what this is called. This little like strip of cloth that covers, that's a little bit different from the fabric of the dress. Provides a little bit of texture and flash. I like that a lot. Little strip of bandeau. I thought that was pretty unique. She's doing well. I don't even know. I don't understand where she comes from or how she all of a sudden blew up. But she's all of a sudden like flashing in my feet. So whatever she's doing, she's doing seemingly correct. And I like this dress. So I'm going to give Sydney Sweeney an A plus this week for fashion. Very nice. So I've been thinking more and more about the Katie Britt response. This is from the 48 Laws of Power, Law 37, Create Compelling Spectacles. I've been thinking about that talk a lot more. It's definitely not as bad as everybody portrayed it, including me. She might have honestly done the best thing in terms of like being an epic troll, like getting attention. That's that's one of the first like laws of persuasion. That's the gist of the law 37, the law of power, is that in order to increase your power, you have to draw attention. Sometimes the best way to draw attention is to do things that are controversial. I don't I don't think that she planned this out like in terms of like four dimensional chess. Like I don't think she was following the law of power. So I think it was a mistake, but I think the mistake might work out in her favor in that everybody knows who she is now. So everybody's talking about her. And now she's kind of going through the cycle of doing more and more interviews. And on them on these new interviews, she's doing better. She's she's sharper. So she might <clears throat> I mean she might have been it might have been the right move. I, I'm just thinking about it more and more. What I think she needs to avoid is she doesn't want to become like a squad member of the right. So like there's a squad like AOC and Ion, not Ion Hersey. Uh, what's her name? Ilhan Omar. Like, you know how they establish like the kind of like the squad, the ridiculous squad that's just so far left. They do insane things. I mean, the amount of enragement that Katie's able to create on the, on the left is kind of a sign now that she's like this new, she's like the new squad on the right. Again, I think, I think, hard to know whether that's a good move or a bad move. I think, I think you want people to take you seriously. So I think, again, she needs to be, she needs to demonstrate intelligence from now on. But it might have been a good move to just sort of get a whole bunch of attention. And maybe that's how you get attention, by right? Just being kind of like ridiculous. So this could work out in her favor. I mean, I'm seeing stuff on Twitter where, like, Democrats want her to, like, apologize. It's like, no, definitely don't do that. Never apologize. At some point, I want to do, like, a video ranking the queens of conservatism, ranking their attributes. I think that would be an interesting video. Okay, but she's moving up on my list. She's interesting to me. All right, well, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist yet. Bitcoin's now holding still around 70000 Again, if you're just getting into Bitcoin... You got to hold and you got to have a real tough mental mindset as it's fluctuating because it fluctuates real drastically. And you'll see you'll see losses of big amounts day by day and you'll see increases in gains by big amounts day by day. You have to have the mindset that you can stand that and just know that long term it's likely going to keep increasing. You don't I think you don't want to try to trade with it. You don't want to try to exit out at the high and get in at the low every time it's going up and down because you never know when that shoot that shoot up is coming up. So you're going to miss those if you're if you're trading. So I think you would need to hold it. That's what everybody who's studying it suggests. And again, like don't buy Bitcoin unless it's something that you actually want. I'd like to acquire Bitcoin and just hold it. I, I just want some. So I'm that's why I'm holding but okay, so why I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist yet. So Bitcoin maximalists, again, I said this in a previous video. Michael Saylor is the most intelligent Bitcoin maximalist. You should follow him on X. He's an interesting follow. He's highly intelligent. And his, his strategy for investing is to take all his money and put it in Bitcoin. And take on debt and put it in Bitcoin. That's the Bitcoin maximalist. I would call myself like a Bitcoin majorist, maybe. Just below the Bitcoin maximalist. The majority of my investment 
probably or the biggest chunk of my investing distribution is in Bitcoin. So I have a Bitcoin majority, but I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist yet. I think the Bitcoin maximalists are a little bit short-sighted. He might be right in that short term. It's, it's possible that the best investment strategy will be in Bitcoin short term. But the Bitcoin maximalists are ignorant of black swans. That strategy is ignorant of black swans. So the black swan events are events that you can't predict that are random, that nobody even knows what they are, but would cause crashes in price. And because Bitcoin's so new, I think it's just real naive to assume that we know everything about it. So to put everything that you have in Bitcoin, that's too risky. That's too risky for me. Because some, something, you know, something eventually long term, something's going to happen, you would think. I'm trying to like think through what, what some of these things might be. If you could actually predict what might happen or at least conceive of what might happen, that's what's called a white swan. It's not a black swan because you can actually predict it. Something that can happen potentially to reduce Bitcoin's price. There might be a situation where there's a, what's called a fork. A fork is where there's a, there's a disagreement in the community and a chunk of the community decides to go off on their own. That's already happened once with Bitcoin Cash, with the split of Bitcoin Cash. So it's possible that Bitcoin could half its value if 50% of the population decided to embark on a fork. That's probably the worst case scenario. Is that all of a sudden, in a blink of an eye, it could go 50%, drop 50%. Now, most of the people who are probably investing in Bitcoin, even a 50% drop, they'd still be probably in the green. So that's probably why people like Michael Saylor like, don't care anymore. Like The odds that he would lose everything is very low. Anyway, that's why I'm not quite a big Bitcoin maximalist yet, is I think there's a list of things that could possibly happen, which would be a rationale for why you would not want to put all your money in Bitcoin. I st you want to be diversified. And especially right now, Doge in the short term, Doge has outperformed Bitcoin. So right now, my Doge investment is it, uh, outperforming Bitcoin. And that's what makes people, some people think that the altcoin season is coming. And that's why I did a video on the altcoins. The altcoin quote unquote season, altcoin season, is the idea that at some point Bitcoin won't be the best performer in the cryptos. And the question is, which of these other crypto coins will be the best performer? Right now, Doge is doing pretty good. Again, in the short term, outperforming Bitcoin. So a lot of people's strategy is to diversify their investment amongst these altcoins. And if they make a big pop in one of these altcoins, then take some of those funds and redistribute some of those funds into Bitcoin the more safer one. That's, I would say that that's probably my crypto strategy. So I have some minor investments in some of these altcoins. See if I can catch some of these spikes. <laughs> I think you need to be patient. I missed two major pops because I was impatient. I missed a 200% gain on one altcoin because I was um, impatient and I pulled it out. I pulled out my investment because I didn't. I wasn't willing to wait. And I was, I was scared that the investment was going down. I missed a 200% pop. I'm pretty upset about that. That was this last last week. I also missed a 100% pop in MicroStrategy. So again, Michael, Michael Saylor owns a MicroStrategy stock, which is a developer upon Bitcoin. I had put money into that about a month ago when it was in the 700s. And now it's up, in, it's up above 1500. So it doubled. I missed that pop because I pulled it. I was day, I was day trading with micro strategy. Because I'm trying to learn day trading. But again, like so far, my short experience of day trading just suggests it's really just better to, to hold, hold things, to, to do longs. So I'm learning as I go. Missed some pops this last week, but we'll keep learning. Anyway, give Michael Saylor a follow. He's intelligent. He's worth listening to on some level. Other things in the news. The TikTok ban. I wouldn't say that I'm providing any novel thought on this TikTok ban, but I can provide a summary of how the Republicans think about it. There's definitely a split in the Republican Party about how they perceive this TikTok. And people are not really understanding the debate nuance of the debate. So at least I can provide some clarity on the debate. So there's essentially two parties of, of, of Republican thinking on this. Actually, maybe three. 
there's three three modes of thinking within the conservative political parties about TikTok. One is this idea about data privacy. Another is this idea about persuasion. And a third is free speech. So if you want to understand Republican thinking about TikTok, you need to understand these three things. There's probably kind of three cohorts that have one of these things as the uh, primal motive deciding how they interact with TikTok. So number one, the data privacy. People are concerned that when you click in to sign in for an account on TikTok, you essentially click all these agreements and it essentially gives the algorithm and the app broad <laughs> broad uh, data acquisition rights to essentially acquire almost everything on your phone is like the hypothesis. I don't actually know. Like I don't go in and read these. At the end of the day, I don't care in terms of data privacy, because I already operate in a world under which I assume everybody has already seen and heard everything I have publicly written or uttered on any media device. Even in the privacy of my own home, I assume that the Alexas are listening and spying on me. So I, I, I honestly don't care about the data privacy issue because I don't, I'm not naive enough to assume that we live in a world with data privacy. I mean, I've heard from some of my computer scientist colleagues that even if there's like a microphone in the room, they can they can decode exactly what keystrokes you're making because they can hear the click of the keyboard and they can translate that into text out from keystroke sounds, click sounds. So the idea that you live in a world where people can't already know exactly what you're writing, have written in digital apps and almost every piece of digital data you've ever pr you produced, we already don't live in that world. So I don't assume that every anything is private. I'm not that naive. So I don't really care about the data privacy issue because I just don't think there's any way we could ever get that back. The only way to get that back is to live without, live off the grid. And I do think there will be a subset of people like the Amish. There'll be there'll be there'll be shades of Amish in the future that just opt out of these digital societies. Okay, but we already are heavily invested in a digital society. So I don't, I don't really care about data privacy. The one, the, these are the two things that I do care about that this issue hinges upon. Two, okay, so this second thing is persuasion. So this comes from, I'll cite him. I mean, this, come, this is not my idea. This comes from Scott Adams. Scott has studied persuasion and written books on persuasion. And there's many psychological researchers who have studied persuasion. And essentially the point is that there are like formulae that formulaic algorithmic like tactics that you can take to persuade people. Okay. So if there, if you understand that there are psychological algorithms that you can follow to make your arguments more persuasive, to convince people or change people's minds about certain things, you can understand how that could be built into an app. And so the biggest concern, national security concern, is that TikTok is being used as a tool of persuasion from the Chinese Communist Party, which in theory like owns the parent company that owns TikTok. So if there's a company that's owned by a foreign competitor, I'll say, because I, I do not think China is our enemy. I see China as a competitor and I see ourselves as we need to be, we need to improve our game so that we can we can do better in the future. I don't think we do better by making enemies. I think we do better by outcompeting people in a friendly way in open markets. That, that's what I think. But the concern here is that children are heavily persuadable. And if you understand the algorithms of persuasion, you can, you can change people's minds. They say that you can't brainwash any individual, but you can brainwash populations. So like if you send out a message in mass, there's a subset that will change their mind according to that message. And so many in the Republican Party fear that TikTok is being used as a tool to change the minds of young population of people in America to think batshit insane, crazy stuff that will destroy our society. I'm actually really concerned about that as well. That, that's a concern for me. I do worry about that. And so the question is, do you worry about it enough to ban TikTok? I'm not at the point where I worry about that enough. The reason I'm not worried about that enough is because there are competing apps. And I, as a parent, have some control over what my children view. So I'm not worried about my children being brainwashed by TikTok because my children don't have cell phones. 
I can control that on some level. And I, I actually like, I am a TikTok member. So I make a little bit of TikTok content. I'm not really that impressed with the app or the algorithm. Even when I go through and I look at stuff, it's honestly not very interesting to me. I, I find myself much more embedded deeply in other apps. So I actually don't even think TikTok wins long term. I think our people are being short-sighted in a sense that I think these apps are going to rise and fall generationally. Like when I was young, the big app was Facebook. And even before that, the big app was MySpace. And even before that, the big app was like Yahoo Messenger, AOL Messenger, things like that. And every new decade has a new app. So I'm not worried about TikTok like gaining all of a sudden like mass converting everybody in the American public to its cause. It's secret cause. I'm not really worried about that too much. Although I do think that we need to be very careful in the sense of I do 100% believe that apps could be used to brainwash the American public. And you probably have seen some side effects of TikTok deciding, for example, what it pushes with its algorithm, being highly persuasive and convincing people of certain things. And we need to be very careful about that and be aware that some of the ideas that you see pop up online it's entirely possible that one person wanted to generate that as an op, an operation, a special operation. And I bet that's happened a lot more than people think. So that's a real thing. But I care most about free speech. So I'm siding on the people who don't, I'm siding with the people who don't think TikTok should be banned. I think free speech just wins in general. I think we, we really need to go back to our constitution and think about the founding principles of this country and liberty. And that will win in the end if we just focus on really good ideas. And one of those really good ideas that everybody agrees with is free speech. Everybody should agree with that. So I side on the Republicans who don't think that we should ban TikTok. And the law that was written, so there was a law that was written where if you agreed with the number two persuasion fear, that you would have in theory agreed with that. And I think like 90% of the Republicans voted for it in the House. And there was bipartisan support with Democrats voting for it as well, the TikTok ban. So this was a bipartisan supported bill that was passed in the House of Representatives to ban TikTok. And the concern was they looked in the writing of the bill and it says in the writing of the bill that it doesn't just apply to TikTok. It's not just TikTok. This applies to any app or any website that can be deemed as spreading quote-unquote disinformation that is a huge problem you cannot support that because that's then just becoming like a tool like the patriot act to suppress free speech so maybe i mean maybe i would think about the ban on tiktok more if they wrote a highly specific bill but our legislators are so incompetent and so incapable of producing specific bills that do specific things and have limited power Every single bill, it seems like, that they put together is just one of these omnibus things that gives vast, like, secret powers to the government that we don't even understand. They need to stop doing that. They, the, the, the legislators and the senators and the representatives, they need to start actually handwriting the bills. I think the bills should be handwritten, like, actually by hand. Then they'll be short, understandable, with clear language. Those are things that people could actually vote on and agree upon. So I don't know what's going to happen with the bill in the Senate. Very interesting, but I'm much more concerned about free speech. So I would ask my senators to think about the free speech angle of this and understand that if they're passing bills that give the government the power to censor websites, apps, anything online based on whether they think it's disinformation, that's dangerous. We should not do that. That's my two cents. Other things in the news, more bloodbath comments from Trump. This is just people taking Trump out of context. They've been doing that ever since Trump ever started running. It's frankly, it's extremely annoying. People need to understand that Trump is in part a comedian and listen to the context of the full speech. He was talking about automakers. Just so sick of the media, the normal media, taking comments out of context and presenting them in opposite of what their intention should be to create fear and anxiety in the public. I just hope people become smarter. And in positive news, Auburn advancing, Auburn basketball, men's basketball advancing to the SEC championship. I think the game's tonight. Good luck. I hope we win that. That would be cool. That'd be great. Okay. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Good.
Show me, I show me, I show me death hell.